Welcome to the Selling in the Motor Trade podcast in association with Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice tips and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bogert. Now, some of you probably already know me as Skippy. I want to start by saying thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Hi, welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Today is another one of my NADA um, specials. You know, I love going to the NADA conference, seeing what's new and fresh and what speakers are out there. I've 24 NADAs I've done now, and I'm a real sucker for it. So I've just come back out, and I've got to tell you, there's someone that I've met out there this time that I really liked his approach. He talked a whole lot of common sense. He was chairing a meeting, which was kind of like a top 20 ideas, and he had three dealers. I believe, Jonathan, you've worked with as one of your clients. I'm not sure about that, but I, I think they're your clients, and there were some just good old-fashioned, simple ideas there. And I thought, I, I like that approach. We've got to get Jonathan on the podcast. So, Jonathan, uh, I just want to say thank you very much, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast. Well, of course, as a speaker at NADA, I appreciate you attending. It's always great when you look out there and there are people in the room. And it was a great ten, uh, attendance. It was a great show in general for us. I guess those three dealers that were present with me on the panel are my clients and dear friends. And uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience and maybe relay some of the information that we saw there and, of course, expand on some of those ideas. Yeah, some great, simple ideas there. But I, I always love the NADA top 20 ideas because you often come out with a nugget or two, which is uh, absolutely brilliant. But listen, I, I just need you to start off with the aha or oh, yeah, moments. Can you run through that with us again? Because yeah. it just really resonated with me. Well, I appreciate that. Right before we started recording this, I was relaying uh, to Simon that that one of the things that I believe about adult learning, and most of your listeners are probably adults. <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Most adult learning really falls into two categories. It has aha moments or oh yeah moments. Aha moments are where new information um, brings about new revelation. Or maybe even old information, but seen in a new way, brings about this new revelation. You have this aha moment where you go, ah, I've never thought of it that way, or I've never seen it that way, or how have I not thought of it that way? And then you have, of course, the oh yeah moments, the moments where you hear something and you go, gosh, why didn't I do it? Why I used to do that. Oh yeah, I used to do this. Oh yeah, I, I used to make that approach, or I used to try that thing. Why did I stop? And so most adult learning is that way. And I have a funny story about that. There's a gentleman who's 84 years old. Mm -hmm. This is in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, and uh, I was visiting that dealership because I had a seminar happening uh, that was going to be an event that they could attend, but it was voluntary. The salespeople got to elect to go, mm -hmm. and I was invited by the management team to do a presentation for about 20 minutes in a sales meeting, and after my presentation, essentially the team members would decide if they wanted to come to my full seminar, and this gentleman, 84 years old, Grady Burke, gets up in front of everybody and he says, I've been selling cars for 40 plus years. And I just listened to this man talk for 20 minutes. And let me tell you why I'm going to go to your workshop. He says, I'm going to learn my three things I never did know. I'm going to remember me two things I done forgot. And I'm going to sell me five more cars. And everybody <laughs> in the room was losing it because this gentleman, this old man who, you know, who, yeah. who, committed to our industry for 40 years, he understood that you're going to learn three things, you're going to remember two things, and you're going to find a way to sell five more cars. And that's really what it's about. So uh, that's why I'm here. And that's why I hope your audience is tuned in. Love it. Hey, Jonathan, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get started in the motor trade? What's what's the backstory for Jonathan? Yes, my, my backstory on getting into the car business is, a, 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 I'm going to call it somewhat non-traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife, had just graduated. We, I was 22 years old. We we're newlyweds. She had just graduated with her undergrad. She got accepted into a master's program and we relocated. Prior to the car business, I spent five years in the door-to-door -door trade. So I was oh. selling. Um, wow. Uh, tough selling. That's tough selling. You know, people say that and and I and I guess it, it can be. I found that it wasn't that difficult for me. And I, I, I'm a car guy. I've only been in cars. 17 years old. I don't know it. So you didn't find it that tough? 
I didn't find it that difficult, in fact. And I'll tell you, when I started with this company, I was 17 years old when I started selling door to door. And I got to tell you, when when I got approached by the elder of my church to 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 join his company, now you are old enough, Simon, and I say this, you know, <laughs> that's every, okay. Everybody, the longer you do this kind of work, the more you talk to people who don't know what a VCR is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, oh, yellow pages. Right. You talk yes. to someone. Well, you realize your reference points are dating you. Yeah. But this was the technology called Dish Network was a new technology, digital programming, digital televisions, digital TVs, digital um, DVD players. All of this stuff was brand new technology. And I was 17 years old and the elder of my church got a licensing contract for Dish Network Satellite. Mm-hmm. And he wanted um, a team to go sell you know, subscriptions to, to, to the satellite service. So I was the number one salesperson in the entire company. At 17 years old. Now, I also happen to be the only salesperson in the entire company. <laughs> I love it. But I was number one. Yeah, now, I yeah. also happened to be the worst salesman in the entire company at that time. The best and the worst. You know what I mean? Very yeah. few people can claim that record. I can say I was genuinely the best and worst salesman at the exact same time. So our company, though, grew. And as we added new sales reps, um, since I was the senior sales rep at 17 years old, um, I was taught to, I was the guy teaching people kind of how the process works and, and gradually our company grew. And as it grew, I became very um, successful at, at what I was doing. And I became the trainer of our company at 18 years old, mm-hmm. teaching these people how to knock on doors and how to uh, get these subscriptions. So at 22 years old, when I relocated out to a new state to Kansas, um, I was given the option to open up another location and just extend my satellite team that way. But I didn't didn't feel like I wanted to do it. It wasn't a challenge for me anymore. And I went to a dealership and this is, this is my foyer into the car business. This is my entry into the car business. As I walked into one side of the dealership, Simon, it's not a big store, it's a small town. Mm -hmm. As I walked in one entrance way on the, across the show floor on the other exit entrance way was a man physically throwing another man out of the dealership, just grabbed and throwing him physically out of the building. Wow. And, and I'm listening, I'm walking and I see that and he goes, go on, get out of here. We don't need you. So and throw, just, throwing a customer out or a, a, an employee? Turns out it was a customer. It was the manager throwing a customer out of the building because the customer wanted a, a low price on the vehicle. Why wow. the manager wasn't happy. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So that was my introduction to the car business. So anyways, so I started working at 22 years old at this small dealership. We were a Toyota Dodge Chrysler Plymouth okay. dealership. And that's how I got in, in the business. And, and, uh, you know, I just really, honestly, I just wanted to have an, a job to put my wife through school. Yeah. Um, she was getting her master's. I was young and thought, you know, when she has her master's, she'll graduate, start making real money, and I'll be a stay-at-home um, dad or something and let yeah. her make it. But that's how I got sucked into the business. So this separates the real motor trades. I love this question. Do you remember the first car you sold? Yes, it was a young lady. Actually, her name was uh, Elizabeth um, Hendrickson. And what was funny about this particular deal is I was brand new to the, I was brand, brand new. Wow, wow. I've got to stop you. It's not just the car, the customer's name, the whole name and everything. It, it's just, don't we remember it? The first car we sold. Go on, tell so, me the story. Yeah, so it was a 1994 Honda Civic. It was a two-door hatchback blue manual transmission. And what was funny about it was my dealer had said to me, I was brand new. I just started like literally the next, the, the day after I got hired. And they said, go walk the inventory and learn the inventory. And I'm walking through and I see in the back of the dealership, there's, we had a, what was called a rock lot, which was just cars that are going to be yep. wholesale, right? So just junk cars. And I see this little two-door hatchback, blue Honda Civic, little manual transmission. And I just love manual transmission. I was like, wow, what a great little car this would be for somebody. So I sit down at my desk, the phone rings. I'm not even supposed to pick up the phone, but there was no one else on the show floor. And the manager's like, pick up the phone. And I answer the phone and, and this lady, this little voice on the other end says, uh, yeah, hey, do you guys happen to have any like Honda Civics, preferably like a two-door hatchback? And if it's a manual, that would be ideal. And I'm thinking, this is a setup. Yeah. This is a joke. They're me- <laughs> messing with me. And I'm like, yes. And she says, um, would it be by chance blue? And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, now you're really messing with me, right? And and I'm like, yes. And she says, well, I'd like to come see it. Can I come see it? And I'm like, yeah. When will you be here? She's like, I can be there in half an hour. And I'm thinking, is this really happening? So I hang up the phone and I go tell my manager and he's like, that car just got traded in. You know, we're, we're not even going to clean it or sell it. I'm like, I just set an appointment on it. I'll go clean it. So I went back there and I cleaned the car myself for 30 minutes. I washed, polished the wheels, vacuumed the car. By the time she showed up, my hair is all a mess. I'm sweating. And she shows up and she's like, it's perfect. My dad said that I can pick it out as long as it's under such a price point. Can You know, I'll take it. And I sold my first car. 
And I was like, wow, that was easy. So yeah. I sold, I started mid month, um, August, uh, August 10th, 18th. I sold 10 cars in the next 12 days. And I just thought I was the stuff. I mean, 10 cars in 12 days. I'm like, yeah, this is easy. Uh, so the next month, of course, they asked the goals and they say, what's your goal? And I, I'm like, I, I can do basic math, right? If I can sell 10 cars in 12 days, then I can sell 20 cars. So my goal is 20 cars. And everybody kind of snickers, right? At this new guy who thinks he can sell 20 cars in his, his second month. I didn't sell 20. I sold 12. And I'm like, okay. So then the month the next month comes around, they adjust my goal to 15 and uh, I sold three and I got fired. So you're all listening to a podcast with an interview from a 20 <laughs> third month, sold three cars and got fired. Stay tuned for more great tips. But, but, but John, I guess like we see this all the time. In the first three months, I see salespeople, their sales go bang, 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 bang. After three months, sometimes over here in Europe, we say, ah, he's got a bit of knowledge now. She thinks yeah. she knows how to sell it and the sales drop off. I can tell you, I've got another theory. I think when we first start, we speak to everyone. We don't prejudge. You don't sit there and get the numpty detector. This guy's not a buyer, okay? When you get in three months, we start to learn that, hold on, what do they owe on his car? Let's make sure, let's look for all the reasons why we can't sell him a car so we don't waste our time. And if you actually have a look at uh, an exercise, uh, by the way, this is a, oh, I used to do this. 20 years ago, I used to say, let's have a look at an experienced salesperson and a brand new salesperson, and give them a score one to 10 on the different parts of the process, their selling skills, their product knowledge, their street wise, their street smart, stuff like that. And give me a score, the new guy, where is he? He looks great. Experienced guy, should be 10, reality seven or eight. So we go down the list, say, hey, have a look at this. The new guy should be selling nowhere near in the same number of cars as the experienced guy. But then we say, here's the next bit, it's enthusiasm. It's attitude. Yeah. It's got that times effect. It's, it's, time. it's delusional optimism. Oh, I love that. Isn't that so true? Hey, listen, that's why I started my own business, that delusional <laughs> optimism there. Okay. Yeah. It's another way of call it's it's, a, it's another way of calling it hope, right? You just you're when you're in the beginning, you're hopeful. And then you learn to not be hopeful, right? That, you're and really what it is, and this is why I marvel when sometimes, you know, when dealers say, Oh, we don't do training or we don't make even training or whatever. your people are being trained let's just be fair everybody is being trained by somebody they're either being trained by some facebook group or some facebook guru or some youtube clip or their co-workers but i as a brand new salesperson was being trained by my co-workers my co-workers were telling me here's how you greet somebody and here's what you do and here's what you do and here's what you do and they were conditioning me to be unproductive and to be mediocre and that's because most people do not want to be around excellence. It, it, it exposes them. And so, you know, I was getting coached on how to pre-qualify my customer by the salespeople who had been there for 10 years and were yep. selling eight cars a month. Dave so, Anderson calls it the five car friends, doesn't he? It's yeah. so true. That's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And but that was my, you know, that, that, like I said, but that catalyst though, that three car month, that getting fired, that get, getting a check for zero, mm. I don't know, again, it, even in the States, it's illegal to not pay somebody for their time. It's illegal. Yep. And I can say this now, and, and it's just, it's a true story. And, and it's just part of the, my story, but my owner at the time didn't pay me for my time. He paid me for my quote commissions, which at the time I had actually not earned enough that I actually had a deficit. So when I had finished my full month, I got a check for zero and a sticky note attached that said, you owe us money unless you're fired. And so after working an entire month, you know, having three cars and there were all these minis and then they took out taxes, insurance, and some other charges for being new. And I owed the store money. And my owner eventually ex expressed to me when I expressed my frustration with it, he said, look, I can afford lawyers. Can you? I'm like, I, no, I couldn't. <laughs> so, so I uh, suck it up buttercup. But, um, but that, but that catalyst though, is something I, I now look back on with such fondness. I mean, I'm obviously in the moment when you're 22 years old and you're newlywed and your wife's a full-time student and you're a full-time provider, and you and you fail miserably after spending an entire month away from your bride. Um, it hurt the pride. It hurt the ego quite a yeah, bit. Of look at my check and look at being fired. And standing in his doorway, Simon, I put on my selling shoes and I convinced him to give me another shot. But here's the truth of that story. When I convinced him to give me another shot, even though he just fired me, um, I was really doing it for self-preservation because I wanted to not be unemployed when I went across the street and applied at the other dealership. I just didn't want to say I was fired. That's when I really took ownership. I really, in that moment, I really, I came to revelation knowledge. It was all my fault. 
everything's my fault. I'm not a victim anymore. I'm now going to take ownership. And that was the transition catalyst in my career and in, in many ways in my life that took me from a victimology to complete um, authority in the sense of like, I own what's happening going forward. And that ownership then led to stewardship, which meant I came to work with a, with an ownership mentality of my day and my time and my activities and my results and no more complaining and no more victimology and no more blaming. If it rained outside, my fault. You know, if a customer came in and, and was upset, my fault. If they stayed upset, my fault. If they left upset, my fault. Everything was my fault, which meant I could now change something, do something. So that was kind of the the, the transition from a mindset shift. Uh, and I would give this to your audience right now. There are many things in your life you don't like. And here's the truth that will set you free. It's your fault. You have created a lack of boundaries or you've created a lack of decision tree or you've created an acceptance and a tolerance to things that have positioned you where you are currently very uncomfortable. And I'm telling you, my friend, it's your fault. And when you own that, it's so liberating. So anyway, so I know we have a whole um, list of topics we want to address, but but I just want to give context to that was the transition for me. Well, well Jonathan, I, I've got to tell you, I wanted to ask you, how do you transfer from that into where you are now? And that, that it, it sets it up perfectly, but... And I can't remember the man's name, but at the NADA conference this year, uh, this is 2024, uh, it was in Vegas. There was a man that I'd never heard of before. He's one of the keynote speakers, but he was a barroom turnaround guy. Yeah, uh, uh, Tavern. Um, I'm going to butcher his name, but yes, I know who you're referring so, to. So, sorry, people listen to this, uh, they'll be uh, they'll message me. Uh, it was brilliant. can't remember the man's name. I, I never heard about the guy before, but I tell you what, it's so, so similar. He said, he speak to all these people there. I said, why is your business failing? And he said, every one of them said, it was the taxes. It was COVID. I couldn't get a chef. I couldn't get this. He said, not a single one of them said, I stopped it up. I got it wrong. It yeah. was me. And he said, it's human nature. We just don't like to blame it. He said, look in the mirror. It's you. And that just sums up exactly what you were saying. It's your fault. It, yeah. It's there. Um, so I, listen, I, I'm curious there. So you're into selling. You've turned it around. Did you have any mentors? Did you have anyone that point you in the right direction? Because hey, listen, we sell sales training. We both our businesses. We talk to these people about how to go from zero to hero. Was there anyone that helped you go from zero to hero? So I got to say, initially in my early stages of the, of my automotive career, no, there really wasn't. There wasn't anybody at my dealership that even initially thought I would make it. My my store did not have a lot of turnover. I think the the youngest tenured experienced person at my store when I started was like five years at the same store. And then everybody else was beyond that. There was a guy who was sales in the year for 13 years in a row at that same store. So there wasn't a lot of turnover. And they just quite frankly didn't want or need or think that, you know, a guy like me would even make it. So initially, the it wasn't an environment like that. And my management, quite frankly, didn't provide it. Um, my mentorship and coaching and outside development actually came from other sources that are non-automotive. So, mm -hmm. for example, big voices that have influenced me are people like uh, Tony Robbins, wow. uh, yep. Dennis Waitley, Dr. Wayne Dyer. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, those influences, um, Brian Tracy, if I didn't mention that name. Yep. Um, you know, so those influences shaped me when I was in door-to-door -door sales. So I carried that over into car sales, and and when I when I made this 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 transitional flip, when I decided that I wasn't going to just let business happen to me, I was going to create business and shape my business intentionally. Um, when I became a good steward of my time, like I said, after that kind of moment where I had some clarity, um, I just became very disciplined about tracking things, which is a skill set that I developed early when I was doing door to door sales, and that I, that helped me really accelerate my my closing ratio and my success in door-to-door -door sales. So I just started treating it like a science. You know, a lot of salespeople, and this again kind of goes back to, you know, kind of the way people tend to approach things. Um, a lot of people really view sales more artistically, which is that they, they see it through a creative lens of a creative expression. So their sales techniques and everything take on the personality of the person who's delivering the techniques. And this is true for trainers too. Trainers, you know, tend to sell from their perspective and train from their perspective the way they would do it based on their personality. Um, I am I have a more, if you will, scientific approach to it, which is to say I look for the guiding principles more than the personality behind it. 
And so when I was looking for my principles in, in car sales, I started looking for patterns and going, what are the patterns that are consistent that I can begin to build principles and techniques and processes and approaches around certain patterns? And so that that started to, to kind of shape my my approach. But that's based on some of the things I had learned from like the Tony Robbins mentality and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about pattern recognition and so forth. But sadly, I can say, no, I did not have mentors and coaches in the automotive space. But, but what I love is all the books that you've read there, the mentors out there. And another one we've got to throw in there, I'm sure you must have come across it, is How I Raise Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. Um, and it's Frank Betcher. He just wrote this idea and he was a door-to-door -door salesperson. He said, let's put the science into the art form of selling and let's work out how many people you need to speak to, how many people you need to qualify, how many people we need to, now in our world, how many demonstrations we need to do, how many deals we need to put in people. And I, I love that. The people, um, our clients listen to this, they'll know about the business plan that we talk about. It just resonates so much with get the activity right and the results will look after themselves. It's so and true. It, it's so true. And, and too often, if you're a new salesperson listening to this, um, you will see your top salesperson in the dealership. Sometimes they might be the personality salesperson and say, hey, there's Bob. I want to sell like them. Let me tell you, you might not be able to sell like Bob. Bob doesn't know how to sell like Bob now because he's done it for 25 years. Okay. Yeah. Bob can get away with stuff. Okay. I, I, I've got to tell you this. Um, Willie Stevenson, if he's listening to this, great. Um, um, uh, fan of the show. Uh, I'm in a dealership. This is in Ireland, Jonathan. Okay. I heard it with my own ears. The customer was miles away on the trailer. Without missing a beat, Willie Stevenson said, okay, let's have a look at this. He draws one circle on a sheet of paper and then another one not far away. He said, okay, let's see where we're at. This is where I am. This is where you are. Let's just call this Earth. What planet are you on? Now, here's the thing. It worked. He said he'd seen it somewhere before in some video. It worked, okay? And the customer started laughing. But here's the thing that brain yourself could get wrong all the time. What they never realize about that, they see Willie Stevens get away with that, and they try something like that themselves. I wonder why they almost get punched. Because what they don't realize, it wasn't the first car Willie Stevenson had sold these people. He sold them eight cars in the past. He had the right to get away with something so silly and cheesy and crass 15 years ago. Um, and actually, you, you just got to be so careful with that there. Um, when you see this, the, that personality salesperson, get to the fundamentals, stick yeah. to the fundamentals. So um, part of psychology is the study of these principles in psychology that allow things to work or not work and explain why. So the, the terminology, the label that I would put on what you just described, the label that I teach in my methodology is to call that under the umbrella of a pattern interruption. Mm -hmm. So a pattern interruption is anything that you do that would cause a shift or change in a person's state or emotions or perception that you do that's unexpected. They don't see it coming. Now, pattern interruptions can be, uh, again, they're very diverse in their application. There's not one version. But doing something like that, the, the, the shock factor of, did he really just say that to me? Did he just ask me what planet I'm on? That shock factor is the pattern interruption. Um, now, I teach a, a whole load of different kinds of pattern interruptions. But pattern eruption as a principle is something that most salespeople can recognize that they have done. And what I want to do in my philosophy is to teach them to recognize the pattern of what they did, put a label on it so they can categorize it in their memory bank, and then re get, uh, realize why it worked or didn't work circumstantially, because certain pattern eruptions would be more appropriate for certain situations. I'll share with you a funny, uh, again, a story similar to this, just to tie the picture yep. together. So a BMW salesperson is walking out on his lot and he 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 just heard me describe pattern eruption in the class. So he's going, hey, John, would this count? He's retelling the story. He walked up to greet these ladies out on the lot. It was just two ladies out on the lot walking through the inventory. And he walked up and he said to these ladies, he said, excuse me, ladies, I need to get your opinion on something. Do my shoes make my butt look big? <laughs> And these ladies lost their mind. <laughs> on the floor. Uh, th th he said they started to almost like wet themselves. They could not contain their lap. And and he said, does that count as a pattern interruption? I said, absolutely. Oh, yes. Yeah, that counts. I said, now you understand, I cannot teach salespeople to greet customers like that. No, 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 no. no. The standard greeting, right? 
But 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 hold on, I, I've got to jump in here. The stand agreement is a hi, welcome to ABC Motors. My name's Simon. You you are leaving, right. okay? And I've got to say, uh, listen, I know people listen to this. Your manufacturers told you that's a standard meet and greet. Do that, guys. You've got to be so careful. I think you've got to be different to what customers expect. Because what does the average think of car salespeople? Yeah. Apprehensive, nervous. What he's done there, he's just proven straight away he's different. Is that pattern interrupting is done brilliantly there. But again, can you teach that? No. You can't but... teach delivery, but yeah. hopefully you can teach the principle. Yeah. And the principle yes. have multiple applications based on the personality and the step of the process. So that's why I believe first in teaching principle-based learning so that they can begin to categorize the information and then hopefully apply it where, 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 where it would. And by the way, even as you describe, for example, the greeting, right? Mm -hmm. And Simon, this is, again, this is, uh, you and I shared this off, off, off camera that we're still getting to know each other that uh, we met at the NADA. So I'm not familiar with your techniques. You're not familiar with all of my techniques nope. to be fair. So there's going to be some things you're going to say that I'm going to go, Oh, that's interesting. Yep. And then I'm going to may have my spin on it to be, to be probably assumed. But it should be like that. Who says I'm right? It's the yeah, so many well, different ideas. Fine. Exactly. Absolutely. I, I'm, and I'm like that all the time. I'm a constant student. Um, yeah. of the, I'm always wanting to learn, but, but specific to the greeting, because if we can get into a little bit of the weeds of psychology for a moment, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to unpack my approach to understanding that philosophy uh, and approach to the greeting. And, and I'd like to use you as my student. Can we pretend you're one of my classes for a moment? Of course we can. Of course we can. Okay. So Simon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of a Socratic method. Most people might be familiar with that. The Socrates just believed that people had innate knowledge. It just needed to be extracted. And with the right questions, they could come to that knowledge. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions the way I would if you were a salesperson in my class. And uh, hopefully it's a value to everybody watching. But when you say, you, again, you walk up to the customer, that every customer is different, mm. right? And I think that most people would agree that everybody's different. Where I put a caveat on that is I mm. say is different in the same ways mm -hmm. so everyone is different but categorically those differences can be put into categories we see the same patterns all the time on the same patterns you do yeah and and i now have been in three thousand dealerships in seven countries and three continents so i have been able to test my theory across lots of different situations and and and, and brands and different models of cars and different uh, markets and and what i found is that people fundamentally are the same in, in the in the pattern. So let's take a look at patterns for a moment and show you how thinking this way can change the way you approach other areas of your sales process. So you're a customer and you're showing up at the lot for the first time and, and, and you don't have a relationship right now with anyone there. What are the emotions that you can feel as a consumer when you see a salesman for the very first time? Let's just walk through some of the psychology of the customer. Apprehension, what, apprehension. Fair enough. Uh, Fear, uh, fear for some people, not everyone. Fear. Fear. So fear, I'm going to put categorically, I'm going to put fear and apprehension kind of on the same spectrum, right? They're yep. on the same side here. Now, now on the other side of the spectrum, what else could you feel? But you know, I've done 40 hours of research. I know I want to go and look at that 530 and so on. Excitement. I want to see this car because I want a new car now. We've got to put yeah. that in there. So, so on the spectrum of emotions, on one end, you can be glad that someone's coming out to help you because you're excited to be there and you want someone's help. And then you go to the other side of the spectrum and you get fear, reservation, hesitation, aggression, right? So on that spectrum, I'm going to make a statement that I'm convinced is true. And I'm going to test my theory through you because you also see a lot like I do. I believe there's actually only five core categories of emotions a person can have when they see a salesman for the first time. Only five. And these five things are expressed in these five ideas. Number one, I want to talk to you and I'm glad you've come out to talk to me. Number two, I am willing to talk to you and open to hearing what you have to say. Number three, I would rather not talk to you yet, but I know I have to. Number four, I don't want to talk to you yet. And number five, I don't need to talk to anyone yet. So again, here are the five emotions. A customer sees me for the very first time in their brain, their initial reaction to seeing me come. I want to talk. I'm willing to talk. I'd rather not talk. I don't want to talk or I don't need to talk yet. Now, here's what's fascinating about the greeting. If I asked you, you're going to walk up to greet me and I'm the customer now. And you, if you agree with my general premise that these five emotions are real, how do you know which one I am when you walk up to me? How do you know? which one I am. 
Now, Simon, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, and we've already pre-agreed before the show that yep. we're willing to do this to each other. Yeah, I loved it. Okay. So, I want to so. demonstrate, I want to demonstrate psychology for your audience because it's a, a way of thinking that they can transfer to so many areas of their process to enhance the customer. So here we go. So so I, I know the I know the customer, they've got the hands deep in the pockets. They're okay. metaphorically protecting their money. So as they okay. walk into the dealership, they immediately turn left or right in America because they want to avoid all customers. If okay. there's a car here, the logical way is to walk in front of it, they walk behind of it and say, shit, here he comes. Here comes a car salesperson. You know, there's some fear there. You know, yeah. when you walk up there, before you get there, Jonathan, you know, the hand's going to come up and it's just going to be just looking. Yeah. First place I've been. Right. Just start of the process. So for that one there, we know they're going to be, out of your five, refresh my memory, it's going to be the... Here's what they are. Here's the emotions, and, and yep. here's the fundamental question I'm asking you if you're a salesperson right now. Mm -hmm. You're going to walk up to me, but before you say a word to me, or I say a word to you, mm -hmm. I want to know, how do you know which one of these I am? So here they are. I want to talk. I'm willing to talk. I would rather not talk, but I know I have to. I don't want to talk yet, and I don't need to talk yet. How do you know which one I am? Okay, well, the last two, I can see that because avoiding eye contact, walking around the wrong way, and avoiding stuff. Okay. When you're walking up to someone, how someone's looking at you and the eye contact. So I'm going to look at those visual clues there, okay? That's and good. and I, I'm going to walk I'm up to- I'm going to be a scientist and I'm going to say, no, there's something you're missing still. There's Go on. A let me show, let me point let me pinpoint it because you're you're right there and this is so intuitive that once you hear it you'll never forget it and feel free to please pass this on to anybody that you think would enjoy hearing this but it's really as simple as this thing here look at their feet their feet tell you how they feel their feet actually tell you exactly how to greet them now when i first express this to any sales group they often have puzzlement and then they're going, okay, I think this might make sense, but take me all the way. So watch this. If I want to talk to you, what will my feet naturally do when I see someone I want to talk to? See, what do your I, feet do? I, see, I know where you're going with the Alan Pierce on body language. What a great stuff. They point towards people. Yes, and I'll take it one step further. If I actually want to talk to you, I don't simply point towards you. I walk towards you. Mm -hmm. So category number one. If a customer wants to talk to you, the indication that they want to is that they walk up to you. Mm -hmm. There are so many customers that a salesperson will walk out to engage. The customer will turn towards them and not take a single step. And you might walk 20 yards to this person and they don't take a single step towards you. And so what I'm saying is if they walk up to you, that is an indication they want to talk. If they are open and willing to talk to you, what would their feet do now? Well, you already said it. They'll point mm -hmm. towards you. Mm -hmm. The body language of a person's feet pointing you but not moving is saying, I'm open and willing to have you, have you speak to me. I want to see where this goes. Open and willing. If I would rather not talk to you, but I know I have to, what will my feet be doing? I don't know. It's it's going to be neutral. It's going to be very neutral there or... Think about it. I would rather not talk to you, but I know Pointed I Pointed away then? Is that yeah. right? And the body's towards you. Know, Okay. Yes, yeah. so what happens is my feet are actually pointing in the direction I would rather be going. Mm -hmm. And over the shoulder, I'm looking at you, waiting for you. This is the closed posture of a person who would rather not talk to you, but they know why they have to. Then you have the fourth person. I don't want to talk to you. What are my feet doing if I don't want to talk to you? Uh, they uh, right away from you. Walking away every yeah. time. And then yeah. the last one is kind of a tricky one. I don't need to talk to you yet. This one's a little bit tricky because you can't actually see their feet because they're still in their seat driving through the lot still. Mm -hmm. So a customer who hasn't even stopped yet, who's just kind of putzing around, they're not yeah. stopping. They, I don't need to talk to anyone yet. And so why do I bring this up as an example of psychology and of psychology? It's because it goes into pattern recognition. So what happens historically is we've taught sales teams a greeting that we say is a professional greeting. Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome to the dealership. My name is and your name is and what brings you to our dealership mm -hmm. today. And this is the classic greeting. Now, here's yep. the question I have. Which of the five will that work the best with? The person who wants to talk to you. This one. But what percentage of all customers, when they see a salesperson they don't know for the very first time, immediately wants to talk to them? Maybe 10%? Yeah. Something like that. So what we've historically done in our industry is we teach a greeting we want them to use every time that works really well 10% of the time. 
And the other 90% of the time, they get they get aspects, depending on which customer it is, they get degrees of tension in the greeting, degrees of resistance in the greeting. Those resistance points manifest in three patterns. Customers manifest resistance initially in the greeting by giving you weak or negative body language when you approach them. It shows up in the form of weak handshakes or bad eye contact, shuffling feet and hands and pockets. These indicators are social indicators through subconscious behavior that I'm not comfortable yet. So salespeople who greet customers who are in these other categories get weak or negative body language, followed by number pattern, number two pattern. They lose the name of the person they just greeted. I'll meet Simon and say, nice to meet you, Simon. Take two steps and two seconds later, I want to call you Steve <laughs> or Peter. Or go, gosh, it's got to be a biblical name, Hezekiah, <laughs> right? It's like we lose people's names. How quickly will a sales pers person lose a customer's name? Within two seconds. And they're walking around, at least in the States, we walk around now calling people Mac, buddy, pal, and sir. We say, what do you think of this one, sir? What do you think of this one, sir? Right, because I've forgotten your name. Second thing, third thing, and this one, you've already stated this, the customer will start dismissing us through verbal cues. Things like just looking and not buying today, and first stop and just getting started and don't need a lot of help right now. And we just want to look around and we just want your price. Demanding terms right out from the greeting. What I, sell, what I tell sales teams is this. If your greeting has resistance in it, it's a broken greeting. Mm -hmm. If your initial greeting, if in the first 20 seconds, 30 seconds, if you have resistance in your greeting, your approach did not match the customer's psychology. And what you're getting from feedback, if you call it negative objections, whatever you want to call it, that negative feedback loop, what that is telling you is that I didn't like your approach. So we are responsible because it's all my fault. Mm -hmm. It's my fault if when I put out my hand, you gave me a weak handshake. I should have never initiated a handshake to someone who didn't want to shake it yet. It's my fault if I get your name and then lose your name. I should have never got someone's name that I wasn't mentally prepared to store. That was my fault. I did that. If I'm getting told I'm just looking and not buying a day and first stop, if you, the customer, are giving me these objections, and I just said hi to you, it is my fault that I approached you in a way that you feel that you must defend yourself right out the gate. And so psychology as a philosophy is looking for these patterns and then beginning to identify what can I do if it's all my fault? What can I do to make sure that these things don't stay with my next customer? How do I reduce the likelihood of this happening to me next time? And so you brought up the greeting. And so I thought I'd expand on that because- no, I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I just want to add to it as well. Um, Please. When we're talking about the body language, the non-verbal communication, uh, and for people who are listening to this, I, I heard him go out and look at Alan Pease's work and stuff he does there. And something else he talks about so much is don't just look at the basic body language today. Have a look at the zone and how close we speak to people. Oh, we do have a public zone. We have a social zone. We have a personal zone and an intimate zone. Amen. You need to earn the right to go to one of those. We look at the initial meet and greet that we talked about. We go straight from public Straight past social, past personal, into intimate when you're touching people. Yes. Okay. And actually, you wonder well, sometimes where it's like the, the stop sign comes up and it's, oh, yeah. stand off there. Uh, I mean, I love with, uh, with body language. There's so many things where we know if we cross our arms, okay, we might be standoffish. But of course, the customer might be cold. You need to look for the clusters of gestures. But so I true. find that the, the, the zones and how close you speak to people as well. That's something else that you need to have a look at in, in that side of it. I, I love these conversations like that. I, I teach sales teams. you got to start your greeting in the public space, but yeah. stop in the social space. Yeah. With most customers, it goes from public to stop in the social. You don't enter into the personal space where you could touch, and you certainly don't initiate the intimate stage where you make them touch you when a customer who doesn't even want to talk to you yet. And, and can I say the other side as well? Don't start asking about personal things about how much a month can you afford? What's your budget? What's that? And you're still at the public zone shouting out in the middle of a showroom floor. Yeah. You see that side of it as well, don't you? Uh, happens all the time. So listen, I, I love these conversations. We could go off forever on stuff like this because it's like, I, I, don't you find top salespeople, they're, they're people watchers. What makes people tick? Okay, I, I just love what makes people tick there. Um, that just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. 
Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.